Hello, thank you for joining us today for the AX30 Mission Overview Press Conference. We are excited to share an update on Axiom Space's AX3 mission, which is the first all-European commercial astronaut mission to the International Space Station. Today, we will hear from Axiom Space's president, the AX3 commander, along with leaders from NASA and SpaceX, the Italian Air Force, Turkish Space Agency, and the European Space Agency. The representatives will provide an overview of the AX3 mission and what to expect as we are one month away until launch. I'm excited to introduce today's speakers. We have Matt Onler. He is the president of Axiom Space. Michael Lopez Alegria, uh, the chief astronaut and AX3 commander. Angela Hart, manager for the Commercial Low Earth Orbit Development Program at NASA. Joel Montalbano, the manager for the ISS program at NASA. Sarah Walker, who is the director of the Dragon Mission Management at SpaceX. Colonel Valero Anatoshi, the Chief of Space Programs and Capabilities Office for the Italian Air Force. Tufan, Tufan Kiyashi, who's the Head of Launch System Development for the Turkish Space Agency. And then finally, Frank De Wynne, who is the Head of the European Astronaut Center at the European Space Agency. We look forward to this opportunity to focus on AX3 and to provide an overview of Axiom Space's third mission to the International Space Station. In a moment, I will turn it over to our speakers for the opening remarks. Following remarks, we'll open it up for reporters to ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit your questions in the chat to the moderator or use the raise your hand feature. When you are called upon, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your question to. We'll now begin with Matt Onler's opening remarks. Thank you, Alexis. And thank you everyone for, for joining and thank you for your interest in the AX3 mission. You know, we're very proud to uh, continue to build on our success for AX1 and AX2 and continue to be proud to leverage our partnership with NASA and with SpaceX. Um, every one of those missions was uh, unique and historic in its own way, and, and this one is no different. Uh, this represents the first all-European commercial astronaut mission to the International Space Station. Um, all of our crew are sponsored by governments and space agencies. Um, and that really is a different way of uh, thinking about getting you know, astronauts to space for some of these uh, entities. Um, we have a really incredibly dedicated crew. Um, each crew member is logged uh, well above the required training hours uh, to ensure mission safety and to ensure our autonomy while we're on board the ISS. We've leveraged literally hundreds of lessons learned from AX1 and AX2 to make sure our crews are prepared um, for their stay on the ISS and that we're good um, visitors to the ISS. Uh, that's very, very important to us to, to be great partners with, with NASA. Um, our AX3 commander is uh, Michael Lopez Alegria, who's a record-breaking former NASA astronaut, and he was the commander of our first private astronaut mission, AX1, and so he returns for a second time uh, uh, commanding this mission. Uh, the pilot is Walter Villaday, who is a colonel in the Italian Air Force. What I think is uh, unique uh, about uh, Italy's uh, uh, participation in this mission is that they're exploring a different model for the future of space exploration. And that being that they've really engaged the entire country of Italy, uh, including many companies that are not traditionally part of the aerospace community. Um, they see uh, low earth orbit and space exploration in the future as really engaging all kinds of companies that are doing research and manufacturing of things in space. And so Italy's really leading the way uh, in trying to engage the entire country. Uh, mission specialist uh, Alper Gazaraci uh, represents uh, Turkey and he will be the first astronaut from that country. Um, I think something that's uh, very important for the country is that they really built this mission and committed to this mission uh, uh, right after the terrible earthquake in the country. Um, I think the country saw this as an opportunity to, to bring the country forward and to look forward into the future. And so we're very proud to be able to support them and uh, fly the very first uh, Turkish astronaut um, in space. And then the uh, final mission specialist is Marcus Wont, uh, who is an ESA-sponsored astronaut from Sweden. And so this represents the first time that ESA has flown an astronaut outside of NASA or Roscosmos. So again, another um, example of 
countries and entities exploring different ways to um, participate in space and the future in space. Crew will uh, go to the ISS and spend 14 days there uh, living and working. They have uh, a full docket of research, over 30 experiments, um, very similar to the X1, X2. The crew will be uh, continually working on experiments and research uh, programs. Uh, in fact, uh, we had more research than we could fit into the mission, uh, which I think is a great example of how much demand there is for that kind of work. And we see these missions as precursors. Um, Axiom Space is building the next generation uh, space station. We're building the first commercial space station. Um, we hope that that space station builds off the legacy of the ISS. The ISS now has logged 23 consecutive years of continual human presence in space. Uh, we hope to be part of that uh, unbroken record in the future. And we use these missions to, to really learn how to work with NASA, how to develop research programs, how to develop partners for, for the long term. We want to, to be partnered with countries and companies for the long term uh, and doing work in space. And so these uh, missions are very important for us to, to prepare for that, uh, that next step. So very, very excited uh, for uh, for this press conference. It's a long time getting to this moment. As you know, these missions are complicated to put together. They take a long time to develop the research program, to do the training. And so we're looking forward to uh, continuing to talk uh, to you all this morning. Um, the mission is less than a month away. Uh, it will be the evening, no earlier than the evening of January 9th. Um, that is January 10th GMT, so uh, plan your travel uh, carefully, uh, but it's January 9th local time at the Kennedy Space Center. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Alexa. Thank you, Matt. We now have AX3 Commander Michael lopez Alegria. Thanks, Alexis. Uh, hello, everybody. It's good to be with you, albeit virtually. Um, I'm very excited to be part of this historic mission and return to space once again. Um, it's a magnificent team that we've put together, and I'm not speaking at this moment about the crew, but all the folks that we've been engaged with over the last several months to get us ready. Uh, Matt introduced the crew, but I'd like to underline how remarkably well prepared they are based on their backgrounds as military aviators with many, many years of operational experience. So very similar to some of the crews that I was able to train with when I was a NASA astronaut. And throughout that training, the crewmates uh, exhibited the same kind of professional and de uh, dedication and commitment that I have come to expect from those NASA days. And uh, I would say they are definitely upholding those um, very high uh, characteristics. So to talk a little bit more about the training, um, we are trained uh, basically the same as NASA or international partner astronauts on the spacecraft, the Dragon spacecraft. Um, we spend a lot of time out at SpaceX and Hawthorne looking at the different phases from launch and activation to rendezvous, uh, proximity operations and docking, undocking and separation, and of course, uh, entry and splashdown. So we do that in nominal cases and also looking at uh, emergencies or systems failures that could occur, like fire, depressurization, et cetera. And I can tell you that uh, we wrapped up the training there a couple of weeks ago, and we feel very, very ready uh, in that regard. Of course, the other vehicle we'll spend most of our time on is the International Space Station. So again, in addition to learning how to live and work about, uh, um, aboard the International Laboratory, uh, we have to be prepared for contingencies in that case. So again, fire depressurization are the enemies of any spacecraft and we're well prepared to handle those contingencies, but the living and working part is no less important. Um, we likely will not encounter any of those contingencies. And so learning how to use the toilet and the galley and how to sleep and all that. Um, and we did most of that training at the Johnson Space Center um, in Houston and also a little bit at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. We likewise spent a little, quite a bit of time at our partner um, facilities. That's the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, Germany, um, as well as Tsukuba uh, near Tokyo in Japan, where we learn how to operate in the ESA Columbus module and the 
uh, Japanese experiment module, the J JLP Japanese logistics and the um, laboratory itself. And finally, we are now finishing up um, some payload training. So we're gonna spend most of our time doing scientific research. Of course, we have to learn how those experiments work. Um, we're also doing what we call baseline data collection, which is collecting samples, uh, blood, fluids, uh, tissue, you name it for the various um, experiments, which we'll be doing in flight as well as pre and post. And basically now kind of in the final stretch uh, before we enter quarantine on the day after Christmas, preparing for a launch, as Matt said, uh, no earlier than January 9th. I can tell you in summary that the crew are ready. A lot of things that we're all looking forward to from microgravity science research to tech demonstrations to outreach events. But the bottom line that I want to leave you, leave you all with is that uh, we feel very prepared for this and can't wait to get on board. Thanks, Alexis. Back to you. Thank you, Commander. I'll now pass it over to Angela Hart um, from NASA. Thank you. First of all, thank you all for being here and being interested in this upcoming mission. It's great to be getting ready for our third private astronaut mission. The Axing 3 mission represents the continued progress that industry and NASA are making to build a robust commercial economy in low Earth orbit. Private astronaut missions, as uh, Matt mentioned, really help to stimulate the demand side of the equation on the low Earth orbit economy and our overall vision for long term sustainable presence in low Earth orbit with NASA astronauts working side by side with private and international astronauts. AX3, as was mentioned, has over 30 investigations planned, which is a substantial increase from AX2 and again, as noted, really goes to the market and the understanding of what people want to do in microgravity. It also builds upon the success that Axiom had on AX1 and AX2. The more we do these kinds of missions aboard the space station, the clearer the picture becomes of how NASA and industry will work together aboard a new commercial destination in the future. On that front, our commercial destination partners continue to make progress, including Axiom as they move forward to develop their commercial destinations initially attached to the ISS for Axiom. All of our partners are continuing to move forward, meeting internal and funded NASA milestones in their design and development of their virtual commercial space station ideals. We're busy preparing to release our request for proposals for space station services in 2025. As part of the, that development, we recently released a request for information in October requesting industry feedback on proposed requirements for future destination services. We're also collaborating with companies in a variety of areas under our collaboration for commercial space capabilities to advance space technologies that will be needed in the commercial low Earth orbit ecosystem, as well as some unfunded partners interested in developing new transportation and destinations. We recently signed an agreement with Axiom for the fourth private astronaut mission, and we're striving for a regular cadence of private astronaut missions through the life of the ISS to prepare for this future that we've been talking about and evaluating the release for opportunities um, for those in the future. The team is working hard to finish out the final work to execute the AX3 mission on board ISS, and we are very much looking forward to the work these private astronauts will be doing on board, and I'm really excited to be part of it. With that, I'll toss it back to you, Alexis. Thanks so much, Angela. All right, and we now will hear from Joel Montalbano from NASA. Hey, thank you, and thank you again for joining us today. Um, it's exciting to be hosting the third Axiom mission to the International Space Station. You know, Matt mentioned uh, January 9th, so you've heard January 9th, January 10th. For your travel purposes, plan January 9th. We're looking at a launch time uh, just after 8 p.m., 8.18 p.m. on January 9th. And that sets us up for a docking on the 11th, early in the morning, uh, 5.15 a.m. Uh, this vehicle will be docking to the uh, forward port of the International Space Station, uh, commonly referred to as a Node 2 forward port. Uh, you heard 14 dock days and over 30 experiments. So just uh, we're excited to have just incredible mission to be talking about it uh, today. And I uh, look forward to the, the upcoming weeks as we do the final processing. Uh, last week, the International Space Station on December 6th, celebrating 25 years of mating of the two modules. Its first two modules, uh, Matt mentioned, 23 years of continuous human presence on board, and, and uh, the team has been rocking and rolling ever since. On orbit, the, the crew is doing great. 
this week, we're uh, focused on the SpaceX 29 undocking activities. Uh, we're watching weather. Weather isn't really good for, for undocking or really for landing. Weather's fine for undocking, but just not for landing. Uh, so we may be up there for an extra day or so. Uh, we'll just watch that. And when it's safe to uh, land, then we'll prefer uh, press forward with the undock activities. We're also preparing for the Northrop Grumman the NG-19 unbirth activities so later this month. Uh, right now, we're targeting December 21st for that. And with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Alexis. Thank you so much, Joel. All right, we now have Sarah Walker from SpaceX. Hi, um, it's an honor to be here today. Thanks for having me. It's, as Joel mentioned, it's been an exciting few months on ISS. It's been an exciting few months in spaceflight here at SpaceX um, since we all last gathered for Axiom 2, which was only seven months ago. Um, since then, SpaceX has launched NASA's Crew-7, safely brought Crew-6 home, and then launched a cargo mission to help support all of the wonderful science um, and crew on board the space station. So as Joel mentioned, one of the two Dragons that are currently stationed on the International Space Station will undock soon and splash down off the coast of Florida, completing the Cirrus 29 mission for NASA and ISS. We're, we're watching for a good weather opportunity as we speak. And now here we are talking about the third Axiom space mission to travel to and from the International Space Station in about a month. It's an honor for us to fly Mike to the space station again on a second Dragon mission. It's a first for us to have a frequent flyer on board Dragon. Um, and, and it's a great honor to support the first trips to the space station for Walter, Alper, and Marcus. Um, as Mike mentioned, they were just out here a couple weeks ago and I got to sit, sit beside this crew um, I wanted to spend some time bragging about them, but I think Matt and Mike have already done that. So uh, just suffice it to say, SpaceX is honored to fly such a, a distinguished and international crew as we have on the Axiom 3 mission. Uh, fun fact, AX3 is flying on the same Dragon and being launched by the same Falcon 9 that supported the AX2 mission earlier this year. Um, both vehicles are on track with margin to support the AX3 launch in early January. In fact, this past weekend, the crew, right after they were here with us, they flew over to Florida and completed what we call the Dragon Test Drive, which was the, the first time that this crew was able to step inside their spacecraft as opposed to a simulator and into their actual spacesuits to check out their seats and umbilical connections and get a feel for the looks and sounds of Dragon that will, the, the specific Dragon that will take them to space. Um, I think as, as I close, I just want to say that this flight really marks for me that a new era in human spaceflight is happening now. NASA and the International Space Station are enabling unprecedented access to space through private companies like SpaceX and Axiom, and more types of people are flying from more countries than ever before in history today because of these efforts. With Axiom 3 next month, 46 people will have flown to space on Dragon across 12 missions representing 14 different nations. And what's to come is even more expansion of access to space for all people, all nations, not just in the years to come, but in the months and weeks to come. It's it's happening today. Um, so to me, there's there's no more exciting time to work in human spaceflight than right now. Thank you for including me in today's briefing. Thanks from all of us here at SpaceX to this entire team, Axiom, NASA, ESA, Italy, Turkey. Um, thanks to all of you for your, your trust and partnership and close co collaboration on this mission. Back to you, Alexis. Thank you so much, Sarah. We will now hear from our European representatives. We'll begin with Colonel Valero and Atashi of the Italian Air Force. Hi, everybody. Uh, as already highlighted by the president on the lure, the Italian Air Force has absolutely the honor of leading the national participation to the X3 mission. In this mission, Colonel Villadei is representing not only the Italian Defense Ministry, but also the Agriculture and Made in Italy Ministries, but also the Italian Space Agency, national universities, research centers, and also industries. All these stakeholders are sharing in this mission the contribution for the success in their field of expertise in a comprehensive national effort. As Lopez Alegria said, Colonel Villadei has been training very hard in order to fulfill all the mission objectives and is very well prepared to manage all the challenging tasks together he and the crew will be facing during the space flight. 
In fact, once on board of the ISS, Colonel Villa Day will also deploy technological and biological demonstration and experiments. And we think that all these activities will surely foster the Italian expertise in the human spaceflight field and they will help to gather new competencies and technical skills. In fact, our overall goal for the AX3 mission is to enhance the role of Italy in the field of space research and economy. We are aiming uh, this objective by trying to engage also new generation of girls and boys, which are from high schools and universities. We are trying to inspire those guys with our passion, with our dedication, showing our application, because we think that this is the only way to make their dreams come true. And this is why we really want the Coronel Villa Day. We have the opportunity to interact live from the ISS with students with stage demonstration in the so-called STEM domain, where STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and medicine. And for this purpose, we are planning also to engage patients of a national pediatric hospital because we hope that this experience will cheer them up and will help them go through their ailments. And this is very important. So this is uh, the end for me. Thank you very much. And the stage is uh, yours, Alexis. Really appreciate it, Colonel. We now have Tufan Kayaji of the Turkish Space Agency. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the H3 mission is uh, of great value to our, our uh, is Turkey's first minute uh, space mission. This mission is very meaningful and exciting for us on the uh, 100th uh, anniversary or uh, of our republic. Uh, we are happy to achieve the goal of astronaut program uh, taking part in uh, minute space mission in a short time together with our valuable partners, which is one of the big calls we announced, announced in our national space program in February 2021. The successful con uh, continuation of our candidates' training and the approach the, of the planet duty date increase our excitement. After Turkey's first minute space mission with AX3, it's desire and call to take part in other manned space mission will increase in the near future. When our astronaut candidate Alper Gezerov successfully reaches the ISS, he will carry out experiments in the fields of medicine, engineering, physics, and biology, the outputs of which will be valuable to us. We aim to obtain valuable information for both our country and humanity by successfully completing these experiments in the macrogravity macro environment. I wish success to Mission Commander Mr. Michael Lopez Alegria, Mr. Walter Valdi, and Mr. Marcus Wand, who will go to the ISS with our astronaut candidate Alper Gezeravci in the AX3 mission. Thank you. Uh, back to uh, Ms. Alexis. Thank you so much, Tufan. And to conclude opening remarks, we have Isa's Frank De Win. Good uh, morning, uh, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome. So uh, we are, of course, also excited uh, to be here for ESA. This is the first time that we fly to the International Space Station with, uh, with Axiom. Uh, it's also the first time that we fly a ESA astronaut from the Astronaut Reserve Corps. Uh, as you know, we had a national selection in uh, 2022. Uh, not less than 22,000 candidates from Europe participated in this uh, astronaut selection. And we finally had uh, 17 astronauts uh, presented to the public and at our ministerial conference last year. And uh, Marcus was one of the, the reserve astronauts and he's now the first one to fly to space. I'm very happy for him. and. Uh, very happy as well that this uh, concept that we have uh, in ESA with uh, career astronauts 
but also astronaut reserves that can fly on commercial missions, short duration missions like these with Axiom, uh, that they find their, their way so quickly. Uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, science in these missions, like for all ESA astronaut missions. Uh, we have a full science and technology uh, demonstration program and a lot of outreach to support uh, STEM and inspiration in, uh, in our member states, but especially in Sweden. And we have more than 80 hours of science that is planned uh, for this mission. So we are really excited uh, for that. But as already mentioned by a number of speakers as well, uh, for us, this is uh, also for the European Space Agency, a first step to see how we can move to the post-ISS uh, era. Uh, ISS will come to an end at some point, uh, maybe in 2030, maybe 2040, maybe later, who knows? But at some point, ISS will not be there, and then we will move probably to a more commercial Leo environment, and we need to start preparing for that. <clears throat> and these missions uh, actually help us do that, uh, see how we can work with commercial operators and how we can still conduct our science and our technology uh, demonstrations that, uh, that we want to do. So uh, we are very happy to be part of this mission. Uh, we are excited uh, to be there at the launch on the, the 9th or the 10th, uh, whatever date you, you choose for, for the launch date. And um, with that, uh, back to you, uh, Alexis. Great. Thank you so much, Frank, and I'm glad we could hear from you. Uh, so thank you for everyone for your important updates for AX3. Um, I'll now open the floor to report a questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, you please raise your hand, um, or you can drop a question in the Q&A chat. Uh, please do state your name, affiliation, and to whom your question is directed to. Um, and to keep us moving, um, please keep your line muted and stick with one question at a time so we have time for everyone to ask questions. All right, we will begin with Jeff Faust. Morning. This is uh, Jeff Faust of Space News. Question probably for Sarah Walker. Um, are you planning to use Launch Complex 39A or Space Launch Complex uh, 40 for AX3? And if the latter, if there, if it's 40, do you have any more work you need to do on the crew tower there to support the launch? Thanks. Hey, thanks, Jeff. You know, I, I think what I would say to start is what a great time in human space flight to now be talking about a single company launching a single vehicle and having multiple launch pads or, or runways to choose from. Um, right now, we're still determining which pad Axiom a or AX3 mission will launch from. We are nearing complete with preparation of the, the Slick 40 um, to support Dragon missions if needed. I, I think you're local to Cape Canaveral, so you may have seen all the excitement as we erected the tower level by level and then um, raised the crew access arm to the very top over the last couple months. So um, I'm personally super excited about this new capability and that it's nearing readiness. We're, we're putting the finishing touches up on the crew arm uh, interior, and then we're awaiting final external approvals, hopefully very soon, by our various regulatory agencies. Um, so that's underway now. Once it's fully activated, we'll have we'll have two dragon capable or crew capable launch pads right 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 next door to each other. And I saw another question in the chat about KSC versus Cape Canaveral. So for those who aren't familiar, while 39A and 40 are a mile apart, right right next to each other, one is on. Cape Canaveral property and one is on Kennedy property. Um, we're super excited to, to have this flexibility and, and we did it because we're seeing a growing demand for Dragon missions. And so we wanna be able to support that, um, that demand. I will say that 39A will remain our Dragon priority pad. Um, but as I, as I said, having the second pad available enables us to be ultra responsive to customer needs and growing demand. Um, by moving a dragon over to LC40 when the need arises. So um, both available hopefully soon. Not sure um, if AX3 will launch off of 39A or 40, um, but I'm just super excited that we can even be talking about the option um, of, of two different pads right next door. Thank you, Sarah. And we now have Gina Sinceri. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, for Michael L.A., how has the training tweaked since your first flight as an Axiom uh, commander to this one? Hey, Gina, thanks for your question. Um, a couple of ways, actually. So I'll address both SpaceX and NASA, and maybe Sarah might want to weigh in on the SpaceX piece, but SpaceX has gone to uh, a less, I'll say, classroom-driven um, 
model where we sit with the instructor and go through a lot of PowerPoint presentations to a self-study model to get um, everybody up to speed. And the benefit of that is that in doing so, they put together what they call a Dragon Rider handbook, which is an amazing compendium of reference material, which is always available to us to go back and look at things to brush up. And I think that it allows the different crew members to learn the systems at their own pace, uh, you know, provided that they do so before they arrive for the first training session. Actually, it gets parsed out in segments uh, for the various topics that we address in the various sessions. But I think that's been a great improvement. And then on the NASA side, we learned that we were trained on AX1 on a few things that probably were not necessary to train a private crew on um, and perhaps missed some things or maybe emphasis on other items, uh, particularly the ops products, which are the tools that we use on board to basically execute our day. And that change was pretty dramatic between AX1 and AX2 as I participated as a backup training um, in the backup training flow for that mission. And I think it's been improved even more for AX3. So in, in both on both counts, I think we're definitely heading in the right direction and getting toward a, an ideal uh, profile for both of those training um, vehicles or ve training on both of those vehicles. Thanks again for the question. Okay, um, I will go on to Noemi Gomez. Yeah, well, uh, sorry, I wrote you, yes, yeah, just for check, 30 experiments in 40 days, and I want to ask which one is the most complicated and why? Thanks. Yeah, take a crack at that. Um, yes, 30 experiments in 14 days, and that doesn't include the um, outreach events that are also scheduled. So it's going to be very, very busy. Um, I couldn't tell you which is the most complicated, but I will say that we have a few that are in a facility called the Life, Science, Life Sciences Glove Box which is kind of what it sounds like. Uh, the operator is outside of an enclosure and puts his arms through two openings uh, into gloves. And the purpose of that, of course, is to keep the experiment in a sterile environment. So there's a slight negative pressure. So we have a fan that pulls air out of the enclosure to keep any contaminants off of the samples. I would say any experiment in that tends to be quite complicated. Uh, the operator is usually talking via a, a headset with a, a hot mic, if you will, to the a team on the ground that is reading the procedures to him or her and um, guiding them through the procedure. So there's a lot of choreography there. Of course, it involves the ground teams, not only with on the science side, but the vehicle side to make sure the communication is uninterrupted, et cetera. So that to me is, uh, is something that I think is always going to be um, quite a, a tricky choreography. And we do have several experiments that will take place in that glove box. If that helps. All right, thanks, LA. Um, we now have Tan Asus. Hi there. Hello. This is John of the Anadolu Agency. My question will be uh, for Mr. Alper Gezer Avcı, if he could hear me. Alper is not online, um, but you can speak to Tufan um, on his behalf. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Tufan, uh, how was the preparation procedures uh, up until now? And since this is the first space mission for a Turkish astronaut, uh, how is the mood between the team members? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is uh, essentially uh, nearly uh, one year this, uh, this uh, period. First of all, uh, the candidates uh, applied uh, uh, our uh, system uh, and background of uh, education and uh, another uh, physical uh, issues and second uh, stage is uh, this uh, experiment and uh, physical and ed ed education issues uh, normally or not not normally not normally uh, this uh, elimination uh, this candidate finally uh, <clears throat> the Another candidate, uh, this 
uh, some tests uh, uh, this physically and psychology and uh, another, another uh, complex problem solved uh, issues uh, 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 maybe uh, sometimes uh, stress uh, under the stress uh, through uh, uh, candidates and uh, sometimes uh, she stays uh, nearly uh, after the uh, all the days after the two candidates uh, uh, approach. I see. Can I ask another question to Mr. Uh, Michael Lopez as well? Go for it. Uh, Mr. Michael, how do you see the Turkish crew and their involvement with the team? Uh, so far. Thank you. Short, I would say it's spectacular. Uh, Alper is a very precise and very prepared person. He's always ready for the training materials when we start a training session, he asks very intelligent questions. But I think your previous question about the mood is uh, an important one. We spend a lot of time together, as you can imagine, and uh, four people from different corners of Europe, uh, different cultures, different languages. Uh, it's not obvious that we would get together and get along uh, so well, but the fact is we, we really do. We have uh, a lot of shared heritage, as I mentioned, all as military aviators. We've also spent some time um, in an exercise that Axiom put together through something called the National Outdoor Leadership School, which is a, an expedition into the woods, if you would, uh, with um, just our backpacks and, uh, in our case, kayaks. And we spent a couple of weeks um, together just living and working in that environment where you really are together 24-7. And I think that has also helped solidify the camaraderie within the team. So in short, I would say we have a, a wonderful experience. And I would like to mention the the backup um, for Alper, who is Tuva Atasever, has also been participating in a lot of our training and in that uh, expedition as well. And he is uh, likewise uh, very curious, very interested, and I'm very hopeful that one day he will be the second Turkish astronaut to go to space. Um, we're now going to call in Marcia Den. Marcia Den, sorry. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Yes, <laughs> Marcia Den, AP Cape Canaveral. Um, I'm trying to get a, a rough idea of how much um, each international entity is uh, paying for their astronaut to fly into space on this mission. I know Axiom One ticket prices were quoted at about $55 million. Is that still the ballpark? Could you give me some sense of that, please? Thanks. I think uh, Matt Onler might be the best person to answer that question. Yeah, uh, and thanks for the question, Marcia. And, uh... You know, the, the price of the astronaut flights are complicated and involve lots of different aspects. Uh, so we don't publicly uh, announce those uh, prices. Um, we hope in the future that those prices continue you know, to go down as space flight gets um, less and less expensive to, to perform. But this time we don't uh, publish those prices again because it's very complex. It depends on the circumstances and the mm -hmm. countries and and that's How, could could you say have the prices gone down since Axiom One? Uh, they have not gone down since Axiom One. Okay, and lastly, when do you think the prices might start to go down a little as you get more of these under your belt? Is that a, still a year or two away? Or well, I think you know the driving cost, of course, is the launch provider, and so I think um, you know SpaceX gets more and more efficient all the time with their operations and so we're hopeful that uh you know it gets easier and easier to put humans in space i think right now in this time period it's still very complicated and difficult and arduous to put humans in space and and have the right safety in place but we're hopeful in the future as uh, more and more launch providers come online and 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 uh we get better and better at putting humans in space those large costs go down. All right, thank you. Thank you. And then we have Richard Tribo. Mute. Okay, hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Uh, 
Thanks. It's just a question about um, Axiom Station and what it's the timeline for that first module launch. And is there any uh, timeline changes for the following modules? And just where are we at on uh, their construction? Thanks. Yeah, so the construction of the station is going uh, very well. Um, the first module is is targeted to launch uh, and attached to the International Space Station end of 26. And then the subsequent modules are nine to 12 months after that. And we kind of have to work with NASA on when those windows are. Uh, the first two modules are generally identical, so they'll be um, ready to fly pretty close to each other. Uh, the third module is based off of a uh, former MPLM. And so that particular structure we already have in hand, so we have an opportunity to fly that uh, fairly soon as well. But um, and then the fourth module really depends on uh, the timing of the end of ISS life. Uh, it, that fourth module has large solar arrays, and so when we unfurl those solar arrays, uh, we have to depart from um, the ISS. So we're going to time that to be close to the end of. Uh, ISS Live, or, or when NASA really needs us to depart in order to make room for the, the orbit. Thanks. Thank you. And then we have a question in the chat from Leo Enright from Irish TV. Question is In light of Italy's shift to commercial seats, how realistic is it for a small country like Ireland to aspire to launching a research astronaut to the ISS? Well, I'd say it's very realistic. Um, you know, we're in discussions with uh, lots of countries that uh, don't traditionally participate in space. Uh, we also have a program, what we call the Access Program, that allows different levels of participation in space. Uh, everything from flying a, a country astronaut to, to uh, flying research uh, programs. Um, so it's very feasible. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, do we have any um, final questions from anyone online? Um, we've answered all the questions in the chat and I don't see anyone's hands raised. So um, we have time for a couple more questions if anyone has any. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap up then. Um, I guess it's all we have time. Um, it's all we have for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing the AX3 crew launch to the ISS, which is no earlier than January 9th. Uh, for any follow-up questions, you can send them to media at axiomspace.com. You can follow updates on AX3 um, on our website at axiomspace.com and on social media. Thank you again for your time and go AX3.